Hey there. Hi. Welcome back. This is day number 115. Today we read Joshua 8 and 9, Psalm 70, and our second reading in Acts 21. We have a great God, and let's enjoy learning about him today. Let's open to Joshua 8. Yesterday the walls of Jericho came a-tumblin' down, after some skillful trumpet-playing while marching around the city for seven days. The city was devoted to destruction, meaning that this was God's judgment upon them, and everything was to be destroyed. Right after this amazing victory, Israel learned through a man named Achan that keeping treasures devoted to destruction makes oneself devoted to destruction. Joshua 8 Then the Lord said to Joshua, Do not be afraid or discouraged. Take all your fighting men and attack I. For I have given you the king of Ai, his people, his town, and his land. You will destroy them as you destroyed Jericho and its king, but this time you may keep the plunder and the livestock for yourselves. Set an ambush behind the town. Joshua chose thirty thousand of his best warriors and sent them out at night with these orders. Hide in ambush close behind the town and be ready for action. When our main army attacks, the men of Ai will come out to fight as they did before, and we will run away from them. We will let them chase us until we have drawn them away from the town, for they will say, The Israelites are running away from us as they did before. Then, while we're running away from them, You will jump up from your ambush and take possession of the town, for the Lord your God will give it to you. Set the town on fire as the Lord has commanded. You have your orders. So they left and went to the place of ambush between Bethel and the west side of Ai. But Joshua remained among the people in the camp that night. Early the next morning Joshua roused his men and started toward Ai, accompanied by the elders of Israel. All the fighting men who were with Joshua marched in front of the town and camped on the north side of Ai, with a valley between them and the town. That night Joshua sent about five thousand men to lie in ambush between Bethel and Ai on the west side of the town. So they stationed the main army north of the town and the ambush west of the town. Joshua himself spent that night in the valley. When the king of Ai saw the Israelites across the valley, he and all his army hurried out early in the morning and attacked the Israelites at a place overlooking the Jordan Valley. But he didn't realize there was an ambush behind the town. Joshua and the Israelite army fled toward the wilderness as though they were badly beaten. Then all the men in the town were called out to chase after them. In this way they were lured away from the town. There was not a man left in Ai or Bethel who did not chase after the Israelites, and the town was left wide open. Then the Lord said to Joshua, Point the spear in your hand toward Ai, for I will hand the town over to you. Joshua did as he was commanded. As soon as Joshua gave this signal, all the men in ambush jumped up from their position and poured into the town. They quickly captured it and set it on fire. When the men of Ai looked behind them, smoke from the town was filling the sky, and they had nowhere to go. For the Israelites who had fled in the direction of the wilderness now turned on their pursuers. When Joshua and all the other Israelites saw that the ambush had succeeded and that smoke was rising from the town, they turned and attacked the men of Ai. Meanwhile, the Israelites who were inside the town came out and attacked the enemy from the rear. 
So the men of Ai were caught in the middle, with Israelite fighters on both sides. Israel attacked them, and not a single person survived or escaped. Only the king of Ai was taken alive and brought to Joshua. When the Israelite army finished chasing and killing all the men of Ai in the open fields, they went back and finished off everyone inside. So the entire population of Ai, including men and women, was wiped out that day, twelve thousand in all. For Joshua kept holding out his spear until everyone who had lived in Ai was completely destroyed. Only the livestock and the treasures of the town were not destroyed, for the Israelites kept these as plunder for themselves, as the Lord had commanded Joshua. So Joshua burned the town of Ai, and it became a permanent mound of ruins, desolate to this very day. Joshua impaled the king of Ai on a sharpened pole and left him there until evening. At sunset the Israelites took down the body, as Joshua commanded, and threw it in front of the town gate. They piled a great heap of stones over him that can still be seen today. Then Joshua built an altar to the Lord, the God of Israel, on Mount Ebal. He followed the commands that Moses, the Lord's servant, had written in the book of instruction. Make an altar from stones that are uncut and have not been sharpened with iron tools. Then on the altar they presented burnt offerings and peace offerings to the Lord. And as the Israelites watched, Joshua copied onto the stones of the altar the instructions Moses had given them. Then all the Israelites, foreigners and native-born alike, along with the elders, officers, and judges, were divided into two groups. One group stood in front of Mount Gerizim, the other in front of Mount Ebal. Each group faced the other, and between them stood the Levitical priests carrying the Ark of the Lord's Covenant. This was all done according to the commands that Moses, the servant of the Lord, had previously given for blessing the people of Israel. Joshua then read to them all the blessings and curses Moses had written in the book of instruction. Every word of every command that Moses had ever given was read to the entire assembly of Israel, including the women and children and the foreigners who lived among them. Joshua chapter 9 now all the kings west of the Jordan River heard about what had happened. These were the kings of the Hittites, Amorites, Canaanites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites, who lived in the hill country in the western foothills, and along the coast of the Mediterranean Sea as far as the Lebanon Mountains. These kings combined their armies to fight as one against Joshua and the Israelites. But when the people of Gibeon heard what Joshua had done to Jericho and Ai, they resorted to deception to save themselves. They sent ambassadors to Joshua, loading their donkeys with weathered saddlebags and old patched wineskins. They put on worn-out patched sandals and ragged clothes, and the bread they took with them was dry and moldy. When they arrived at the camp of Israel at Gilgal, they told Joshua and the men of Israel, We have come from a distant land to ask you to make a peace treaty with us. The Israelites replied to the Hivites, How do we know you don't live nearby? For if you do, we cannot make a treaty with you. They replied, We are your servants. Joshua demanded, but who are you? Where do you come from? They answered, Your servants have come from a very distant country. We have heard of the might of the Lord your God and of all he did in Egypt. We have also heard what he did to the two Amorite kings east of the Jordan River, 
king Sihon of Heshbon and king Og of Bashan, who lived in Ashtaroth. So our elders and all our people instructed us, Take supplies for a long journey. Go meet with the people of Israel and tell them, We are your servants. Please make a treaty with us. This bread was hot from the ovens when we left our homes, but now, as you can see, it's dry and moldy. These wineskins were new when we filled them, but now they're old and split open, and our clothing and sandals are worn out from our very long journey. So the Israelites examined their food, but they did not consult the Lord. Then Joshua made a peace treaty with them and guaranteed their safety, and the leaders of the community ratified their agreement with a binding oath. Three days after making the treaty, they learned that these people actually lived nearby. The Israelites set out at once to investigate and reached their towns in three days. The names of these towns were Gibeon, Kafirah, Be'eroth, and kiriath Jearim. But the Israelites did not attack the towns, for the Israelite leaders had made a vow to them in the name of the Lord, the God of Israel. The people of Israel grumbled against their leaders because of the treaty. But the leaders replied, Since we have sworn an oath in the presence of the Lord, the God of Israel, we cannot touch them. This is what we must do. We must let them live, for divine anger would come upon us if we broke our oath. Let them live. So they made them woodcutters and water carriers for the entire community, as the Israelite leaders directed. Joshua called together the Gibeonites and said, Why did you lie to us? Why did you say you live in a distant land when you live right here among us? May you be cursed. From now on you will always be servants who cut wood and carry water for the house of my God. They replied, We did it because we, your servants, were clearly told that the Lord your God commanded his servant Moses to give you this entire land and to destroy all the people living in it. So we feared greatly for our lives because of you. That is why we have done this. Now we are at your mercy. Do to us whatever you think is right. So Joshua did not allow the people of Israel to kill them. But that day he made the Gibeonites the woodcutters and water carriers for the community of Israel and for the altar of the Lord, wherever the Lord would choose to build it. And that is what they do to this day. And now let's open to Psalm 70. David pleads in this psalm for help against his enemies, and this poem is a repetition of the last part of Psalm 40. Psalm 70 For the Choir Director A Psalm of David Asking God to Remember Him Please, God, rescue me. Come quickly, Lord, and help me. May those who are trying to kill me be humiliated and put to shame. May those who take delight in my trouble be turned back in disgrace. Let them be horrified by their shame, for they said, Aha! We've got him now! But may all who search for you be filled with joy and gladness in you. May those who love your salvation repeatedly shout, God is great! But as for me now, I am poor and needy. Please hurry to my aid, O God. You are my helper and my savior. O Lord, please don't delay. And now for the second time, let's turn to Acts 21. Paul, Luke, and the other companions arrived in Jerusalem. On the way, Paul heard the prophecies that he should not go to Jerusalem. He received advice from James. 
Once there, he received advice from James and the others which turned out to be disastrous in the end. Should Paul have followed the advice he was given by prophecy? My opinion is that he did the will of God which had already been revealed to him before those prophecies. In other words, the information in those prophecies that Paul would be arrested and beaten was from God. The interpretation that Paul should not go there was added by people, and Paul was right in not following their advice. Acts 21, starting at verse 20. After hearing this, they praised God, and then they said, You know, dear brothers, how many thousands of Jews have also believed, and they all follow the law of Moses very seriously. But the Jewish believers here in Jerusalem have been told that you are teaching all the Jews who live among the Gentiles to turn their backs on the law of Moses. They've heard that you teach them not to circumcise their children or follow other Jewish customs. What should we do? They will certainly hear that you have come. Here's what we want you to do. We have four men here who have completed their vow. Go with them to the temple and join them in the purification ceremony, paying for them to have their heads ritually shaved. Then everyone will know that the rumors are all false and that you yourself observe the Jewish laws. As for the Gentile believers, they should do what we already told them in a letter. They should abstain from eating food offered to idols, from consuming blood or the meat of strangled animals, and from sexual immorality. So Paul went to the temple the next day with the other men. They had already started the purification ritual, so he publicly announced the date when their vows would end and sacrifices would be offered for each of them. The seven days were almost ended when some Jews from the province of Asia saw Paul in the temple and roused a mob against him. They grabbed him, yelling, Men of Israel, help us! This is the man who preaches against our people everywhere and tells everybody to disobey the Jewish laws. He speaks against the temple and even defiles this holy place by bringing in Gentiles. For earlier that day they had seen him in the city with Trophimus, a Gentile from Ephesus, and they assumed Paul had taken him into the temple. The whole city was rocked by these accusations, and a great riot followed. Paul was grabbed and dragged out of the temple, and immediately the gates were closed behind him. As they were trying to kill him, word reached the commander of the Roman regiment that all Jerusalem was in an uproar. He immediately called out his soldiers and officers and ran down among the crowd. When the mob saw the commander and the troops coming, they stopped beating Paul. Then the commander arrested him and ordered him bound with two chains. He asked the crowd who he was and what he had done. Some shouted one thing and some another. Since he couldn't find out the truth in all the uproar and confusion, he ordered that Paul be taken to the fortress. As Paul reached the stairs, the mob grew so violent the soldiers had to lift him to their shoulders to protect him, and the crowd followed behind, shouting, Kill him! Kill him! As Paul was about to be taken inside, he said to the commander, May I have a word with you? The commander asked, surprised, Do you know Greek? Aren't you the Egyptian who led a rebellion some time ago and took 4,000 members of the assassins out into the desert? No, I'm a Jew and a citizen of Tarsus in Cilicia, which is an important city. Please let me talk to these people. The commander agreed, so Paul stood on the stairs and motioned to the people to be quiet. Soon a deep silence enveloped the crowd, and he addressed them in their own language, Aramaic. Thank you for joining me in this reading today. 
And now let's pray together. Our glorious Heavenly Father and our Lord Jesus, today I am reminded of how important it is to always ask for your will, for your direction, and to not trust in appearances like Joshua and the Israelites did with the Gibeonites. Lord, we pray that you would give us wisdom in asking and in understanding your will. You promise to give us your will in Romans 12, verse 2. And so we ask you, Lord, that you would be doing that as we submit ourselves to you. And then, Lord, we pray that any who are in trouble or in disgrace, or threatened by shameful things, that you would help them, that you would be their Savior, and that you would come to their aid. Be our rescuer, Lord, we pray. And as for us, we love your salvation, O Lord, and we proclaim you are great. Today may we live for the glory of Christ Jesus, our Savior.